Test one, two. All right. Excellent. Hopefully that was a momentary blip. I have no idea if we're streaming live yet. All right, we are a go. Hi, everybody. My name's Dan from Datadoc. I am pleased and honored to be helping out with this third very special edition of DevOps Days Kiev from home, a special event for a special time. This is the second day of three days of live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, all your favorite places. Uh, we have a ton of good material that we've already seen yesterday. We're gonna see a ton more today and a ton more tomorrow as well. Of course, hey there, everybody. Hopefully, we're back on. Looks like I'm having a, a, a couple of minor problems connecting to the streaming platform. Hopefully, those are just some temporary hiccups. Where was I? Ah, yes. Because this is all on social media, we're on the YouTube, we're on the Facebook and everything, it's incumbent upon me to ask you to like and subscribe. All right, great. Is my video working? I'm getting mixed results here. All right, let's try this one again. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name's Dan, I'm from Datadog, and I am pleased as punch, just absolutely honored to be participating and helping out in this uh, third very special edition of DevOps Days Kiev. This one's from home, a special event for a special time. This is the second day of three days of live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, all your favorite places. We have a ton of great material we've already seen yesterday, a ton of great material we're gonna see today and tomorrow as well, as I said, it's three days. It is social media, so it's incumbent upon me to ask you to like and subscribe. So please go ahead and do that now if you haven't. All right, great. Yesterday, we had a great intro talk by uh, Baruch and Leonid and an excellent technical talk by Chris Nova, who really just dove into some really key concepts in the security world. So. Thanks for that so much. Today, another great lineup. We have two talks, uh, Niall Murphy from Azure, whose name you may know, and of course, Liz Fong Jones from Honeycomb, whose name you may know as well. Tomorrow, I will be sitting down and chatting with Kelsey Hightower, another name you may have heard of. So again, a lot of great content coming your way today and tomorrow. One thing I'd like to get out of the way right now is that this is the internet. And this is a very strange time for people on the internet. And because it's an online event, things can go wrong. We've already seen it a little bit today, for example. So yesterday, we had a bit of an interesting incident. The DevOps Days Kiev team uh, would basically just like to extend their apologies for some of those issues that occurred yesterday. Now, in the interest and spirit of DevOps, we'd like to just share with you what happened yesterday 
and what steps have you taken today to try to make sure that the experience is as fluid for you, the audience, as possible. So let's just be honest, right? Sometimes things break. In fact, failure modes are sometimes the default modes. So what the DevOps Days Kiev team has put together today is basically a multi-region, multi-cloud setup, right? They've taken into account bus factor, communication situation, ethical situation, and have tried to build something a bit more robust to deliver the content. But of course, again, things can go wrong. What they've done today is that they've analyzed yesterday's incident. They did a blameless postmortem, right? Again, this is DevOps days and found three possible ways to you know, resolve this inconvenience. Uh, basically, they went for what they believe to be the most reliable. So there's two independent groups of technical staff in two different home offices running on two different internet providers in two different Kiev regions, just in case there are electricity issues, okay? If something goes wrong, it'll be possible to continue streaming from another location. The SLA is apparently of uh, one to three minutes, so that's very good. And if you don't know what an SLA is, perhaps that question will be answered either today or tomorrow in the talks. It depends mostly on how fast the speaker and the moderator can rejoin the stream. And we've actually already tested out that a little bit today. So as we can see, it's a relatively quick turnaround in the case of small internet blips. Also, we've asked everybody to uh, test beforehand. Everything seems to be working. And where possible, some pre-recorded talks. So that's fantastic. We're going to have a live Q&A session. That live Q&A session is going to be, uh, well, live. So hopefully, we don't have any blips on that one either. All right. Why are we doing this online? If you've been to DevOps Days before, you know that it's a great in-person event, right? Hallway track is fantastic. The networking is fantastic. The, the, the attitude and the personalities and the spirit of DevOps Days is, is one of open communication and just getting together and sharing. Unfortunately, in today's extraordinary times, we were unable to provide that in-person experience. Fair. And that's why we're doing this online. It's easy enough for us from the comfort of our own homes to participate in this event. And so on behalf of DevOps Kiev and, and really just everybody, uh, we'd like to say thank you to all of the brave people who are putting their lives at risk every day. And that's emergency workers, doctors, all the way down to people that are driving trucks, fulfilling orders, working supermarkets, whatever that means. If you're getting out there and, and doing work, thank you so much for continuing to support humanity. Let's call it what it is. Uh, as you know, uh, people around the world are uh, unfortunately falling ill and more than a thousand doctors have contracted the disease in Ukraine alone. And there are people who need help and need your support right now. So I would like to announce a small charity project. All right. Uh, any money that's donated through the charity project, uh, this Ukraine event will go to help uh, people in the Ukraine who are, again, putting their lives on the line. We're going to have some more information about that in the YouTube video description. So if you are able and if you are willing to help out not only first responders, but uh, uh, everybody, again, who's keeping the country running, please feel free to do so. All right. One more bit of housekeeping before we get on the way. We have a job board. All right. This is one of the cool things about DevOps Days Kiev, the in-person format, and now on the uh, virtual format as well. We do have a job board. If you're looking for a job, you're looking for a long-term thing and some gig work, uh, go check it out. Again, that's going to be in the YouTube video description. All right. So hit that up. It could be your next excellent opportunity there. I mentioned a little while ago that we are going to be doing a live Q&A. All the live Q&A is going to be performed through an online application called Slido, sli.do. It's fairly straightforward to use. We use it at DevOps Days Paris as well. So we're going to be dropping that into the chat. So if you're watching on YouTube, it's going to be dropped into the chat. Uh, each of the speakers has their own Slido. So there will be a Slido for Niall and a Slido for Liz. Again, that's going to be dropped into the chat. If you have any questions, don't wait till the end. Just go ahead and ask those questions, pop them right into the Slido, and then those are going to be uh, filtered up, and we'll ask some of them at the end of the session. 
between the presentations or even during the presentations uh, and at the short breaks and, and after the presentations as well, we do have uh, some Zoom breakout rooms. If you just wanna chill out, get some hallway track in with the other audience attendees, it could be a nice opportunity to just meet some new people or see some familiar faces. Uh, that's all on the DevOps Days uh, Ukraine or DevOps Days Kiev website as well. And that link is also going to be dropped into the YouTube chat as well. So don't worry about it. Okay, without further ado, I am pleased as punch to be welcoming our first speaker. Uh, many of us feel passionately about the Site Reliability Engineering book and its accompanying work, the Site Reliability Workbook. Uh, I know it's been a reference material of mine for some time. Uh, in our minds, we may think that these books are written by you know, anonymous people at some large company, uh, you know, by Google, for example, and only a few of us ever get a chance to see the real people behind that, that by Google. So in this case, I am proud to show you the real Niall Murphy, now working for Microsoft, who was instrumental in making the site reliability engineering books happen. So without further ado, warm round of virtual applause for Mr. Niall Murphy. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the talk. This talk is called Mental Models for Reliable Software Engineering. My name is Niall Richard Murphy. I work in Azure Site Reliability Engineering, and you can get me at niall at microsoft.com or I'm nylm at Twitter. So I don't come from a, a DevOps background as, as such. You might not have heard of me. You might be wondering what I'm doing here. Uh, actually, the first thing to say is I'm honored to be asked to, to speak. I have been thinking about the problems of reliability in, in software and system and indeed cultural transformations for a long while, a lot of which I think are, are issues that overlap, overlap strongly with DevOps areas of concern. Uh, but if you have heard of me, this is probably why uh, these books and in particular the Global DevOps uh, Bootcamp uh, keynote last. If you uh, haven't heard of me, uh, or if the term SRE scares and confuses you, or if you're wondering what this has to do with the lived experience of a production-minded developer uh, on a team, don't worry, we will uh, deal with that very shortly. So I think people often talk about uh, SRE, site reliability engineering, as if, as if it came out of nowhere or a very specific place, uh, or it has no real overlap. That's not really true in my view. In my view, they both spring from a kind of a similar dissatisfaction with the state of the world and in particular the state of how most organizations handle the question of operations or silos in general, and but definitely specifically uh, the interaction between product development and operations. So it's well known, I think, that operations is a hard problem. Uh, lots of folks have tried to solve it. Uh, there academic discipline dedicated to it. Uh, it does slightly depend on your, your definition, I suppose. There might be a bit of wiggle room there. Uh, but uh, broadly speaking, uh, operations is hard. Lots of different approaches to this. We call out ITIL, DevOps, SRE. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'll say DevOps is a philosophy, SRE is, is a discipline, um, a job bit more tight on definitions of some things, a bit less tight on others. I will say both of them, certainly from my point of view, care very much about culture, measurement, lean, efficient operation, uh, the, the CAMS uh, acronym underpinning a lot of depth. The one difference I will uh, highlight is that SRE is kind of sort of like DevOps, except it's more kind of production oriented, shifting left over to the design phase of the SDLC and DevOps is more feature focused, shifting right to production uh, or more code or product focused, possibly is one way to. Uh, hat tip to Tom Limoncelli for this definition, which I think uh, surface some of the, the, the differences between DevOps folks and SRE folks you might encounter in the real world and what they're actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But there's actually a lot more in the uh, article linked there, which is uh, DevOps article in the uh, SRE workbook. So check that if you want to know more, but that's the basic for what I'm going to talk. Wiggle room aside, the initial SRE team 
very, very first set of people uh, uh, were just people who cared about production slightly more than the other engines um, on the search. So they more or less self-selected into and that matches my, some of my experience and my intuitions about DevOps. Similarly for Microsoft, while we have folks who do horizontal uh, under the heading of SRE, we also have folks who work quite closely in a feature team scoped, except they're working items to do with reliability uh, and, and other non-direct feature. Um, of course, there's always a question of what the definition of a thing might be and what changes after marketing happens to that thing, um, but we'll leave those aside for a moment. So speaking of definitions, um, probably an appropriate moment to look at uh, definitions of SRE, just to frame the rest of them. Um, in this definition, which is the Azure SRE specific definition, obviously your mileage may agree. Uh, what I would say is that we tend to look at SRE as an engineer devoted to helping an organization sustainably achieve the appropriate level of reliability in their systems, services, and um, uh, different words are carrying a lot of weight there. Um, an emphasis much so uh, engineering then uh, of course is is part of here a couple of the important words i would surface from that are sustainably and appropriate and obviously reliability of course and um, get on to that in a little bit more deeper on um but having decided reliability is important to you some but you have to figure out what the appropriate level of reliability is uh, and not only that, because that answer might vary, obviously, depending on product, organization, etc., but to help an organization sustainably achieve that, i.e. not throwing people at the problem in order to um, service or, or system continue to operate. And in general, this means software supporting the reliable operation of the software, which is the key to scaling um, and the key to in many cases, reliable operation. So let's talk a little bit about the premises uh, of this conversation. So mental model point of view, what am I talking about here? I think the first thing to say is that the art of making good CERN and good systems that were uh, obviously relies much more uh, on much more than simply. So the key to successfully making good reliable work is uh, on an organizational basis is understanding what mental model of this activity the various stages have and approaching them and asking them questions and saying things to them in a way that they, for example do all of your stakeholders even think about reliability at all maybe uh, or if they do think about reliability do they think it's important where did this uh, how important is it compared to other things uh, many years on, I think from the emergence of DevOps as a concept, there are many organizations that are still struggling with it as an idea, struggling with various conflicts inside organizations that limit it, uh, and even more fundamentally with the idea that holistic views of the software, software development lifecycle are useful. And so I won't really talk about the technical side of mental models for mobility and how to design with failure in mind. The previous level DevOps bootcamp um, keynote has a lot, and there's a, a very large amount of um, collateral for that if you want to edit. it. This is more about how to bake reliability in as a first order concern in your relation. And for reliability, I, mean, I think reliability is important. I think customers as well. There are also other properties, security and, and so on. Um, that you might want to add as, as significant items of concern within your development process that don't necessarily get all the attention they should today. So for today, let's, some of the key questions. Uh, first one being, why care about reliability? I mean, if your customers are going to get, doesn't matter how long your systems, well, a bit more complicated than that, of course. If the systems are down, the software has no value, as I is fond of saying, said so in the uh, workbook. Uh, reliability also, as a, a thing in general, um, I 
think of it as being quite customer friendly because it's user oriented. If the thing isn't responding correctly, the, the product isn't. Um, it's complicated and difficult to do well, right? It might even be in an emergent property in, in some uh, properties that you might desire, attributes you might desire for your, your software that could fit under that head on um, security in particular. Uh, not being conventionally understood or understood by those close to it as a Boolean, you are secure or not secure, uh, but maybe is more of a. Uh, but I think most people, my sense is in a professional software development, most people, when they are concerned about questions of reliability and basically non feature driven development, how asking themselves questions like, how can I get this work prioritized? How can I get it prioritized within my organization? Really the thing. Um, so according to this view of the world, as well as operations being hard, which we there, um, software is also hard, as well as yield. We said earlier, um, Software is also hard, as well as eating the world, software is hard. And so uh, in this theory, or in this view of the world, when you're in transformation, what matters is really the mental models of the people doing the transformation, or in some cases, not doing the transformation. And sometimes they might have a more accurate model of uh, the act of doing software appropriately within your organizational context than you do, or maybe not. Uh, in particular, I guess the question is the model of software development. What's it about? What, you're really, what are you really trying to do? How should it best be done? Uh, often reflecting itself in questions of prioritization, etc. Uh, so let's start off with what I'll call the, the null hypothesis, the, the thing which uh, has to be rejected uh, in some readings of the statistical term, or maybe even a market-based hypothesis is a slightly better one. Uh, so in this model of the software development process, nothing matters except feature development for revenue capture. There's the thing called technical debt I've heard of. We don't pay it uh, unless it's utterly unavoidable. And uh, we avoid treating with anything else if at all possible. There are less intense varieties of this uh, particular model available and uh, sometimes it's a question of prioritization, of course. Um, but like any model, it has some strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I think its primary benefit really is that it's extremely focused. Uh, there isn't really a doubt about what's valued uh, in that situation, and that in itself is actually a benefit, uh, provides organizational clarity. I think it has a significant number of weaknesses, though. Uh, primary amongst them that I'll surface in this talk uh, is a, a very interesting paper um, from Microsoft uh, called Online Experimentation at Microsoft, uh, which suggests that when we're doing feature development for revenue capture, actually not all of those features are equally revenue capturing. And we're actually not very good at figuring out which of them are, which of them is gonna work uh, for revenue capture. And we're uh, probably about as bad as, as figuring out how much revenue capture we'll get from them. The data in the paper, which I, strongly encourage you to go out and uh, look at, suggests that actually uh, on, a, on a pure numbers volume basis, when you're doing revenue capture via features, about one third of those features actually have a negative impact. Now, it might not be as severe as you do a feature and actually it loses you money. It might merely be you spend time and energy on that feature, which turns out to do not very much for you, and so it's a total negative. The, the total cost of it is, is negative. Um, but actually about a third of the features that get developed are neutral 
like revenue neutral. Uh, maybe they paid for the cost of the development team time, you know, uh, or about, about that. Uh, and it's only one third of them that are uh, really revenue positive. And some of those are, you know, you get extraordinarily lucky and uh, featured very, very popular. And it's one of those famous 10x style experiences, but most of them aren't that, uh, particularly in the context of online services. You're lucky to get kind of uh, single digit percentage boosts out of relatively mature products um, with new, new feature launches. Another possibly even more fundamental question is the question of measurement. Uh, when we engage in the idea of revenue capture by feature development at all, we have to measure something. Uh, and in order to say that we're doing this successfully and not all of those uh, measurements are actually correct or useful or easy to put together, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my favorite example from a related paper um, at the online experimentation uh, website is that uh, is the statement that users that see more error messages in uh, Office 365 also churn less. So therefore we should show them more error messages in order to get them to stay even more strongly with the product. Uh, so obviously there's a, a correlation, not causation thing going on here. Um, but I, I, I think taken together, the fact that we're not necessarily sure how effective any particular piece of work is going to be, particularly in the revenue capture domain. And two thirds of them, like based on this data, are potentially either bad or just useless for you. Uh, it might open up the possibilities to ask serious questions about prioritization. Um, are all features equally valid? Well, the data suggests they're not. And, and it's equally valid under the heading of revenue capture, right? There are other headings under which they could be uh, evaluated. Uh, one which is even uh, more opposite perhaps is does every feature piece of work override every non-feature piece of work? Are the results uh, of this work um, as measured, causal and not correlative. Uh, is revenue capture better, absolutely better than revenue loss prevention in every case? I think uh, many folks would understand that over time, uh, these, these questions are actually become of critical importance, being able to, to answer them successfully for your particular context is of critical importance. As I say, it's not a super realistic model since most professionals at some stage, even most decision makers, accept that you can't just do features all the time. Uh, but our understanding uh, across the industry of the appropriate ratios for this, um, I don't think they're, they're very advanced. We don't really have good, uh, a good nuanced understanding. We don't even really have a, a strong set of rules of thumb. The closest I've come uh, to this professionally from the rule of thumb point of view is that an SRE organization should be about five to 10% um, size of a dev, product dev organization uh, for which there's basically no hard evidence that it's true uh, or strongly related to questions of technical debt. Uh, but anyway, let's go on. Uh, so uh, move on to another historically popular model, hard boundary model. Uh, so we accept in this model that things like incidents and technical debt exist, but we try and get somebody else to handle them. We're basically putting a partition between folks who work on features and folks who work on more or less everything else. Uh, and this way we're hoping to get large or better feature velocity or somehow uh, insulate uh, folks from each other. So, I mean, like every model, this has strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I suppose from my point of view, the strengths are the, the sharp lines um, of maybe it's authority, but certainly it's kind of organizational responsibility uh, lead to clarity. Clarity is important. 
Um, it's a model that can be cheaper to run, possibly related to outsourcing as well. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the set of weaknesses are really very, um, very large and important in my point of view. Um, probably don't need to spend a lot of time going over this in a um, DevOps context. Uh, but basically every, every theme in mo modern software development best practice relates to feedback loops of one kind or another, uh, broken right, in, in this case. Um, also questions about lack of parity of esteem, encouraging finger pointing, latency of delivery of features because of kind of organizational paralysis, uh, ultimately worse for customers really. Uh, and I suppose that a cost center focused view on IT often ends up having agility related consequences. Um, my favorite book in this respect is Accelerate by Forrest Gunn and Humble and Kim et al, which I strongly recommend uh, you read just generally and also specifically on this topic. I think interesting questions to ask about this model and when you're trying to perhaps in investigate an area of the organization that has this model or trying to produce hopefully away from us. Um, what is actually better for the customers and, and the staff than this model? Are there alternate models available? Do you have a measurement culture and the measurements themselves in place to understand what you're doing and, and how you're doing it? And this is uh, where Accelerate is, um, is great because it's got really um, sharp definitions uh, and actual outcomes relating to survey data, uh, which can be straight into these conversations. Um, another key question is why is cost central to these discussions rather than value? Uh, and the, the interplay bet between those two uh, can be a very good conversation to be in. Um, I suppose ultimately that a relatively objective evidence suggests that being better at the business of software, particularly with respect to time to prod, time to get to prod, and features to prod, means that you're better at business, never mind the business of software, you're, but you're better at the business full stop. Uh, and like, why aren't we doing that? Or why aren't we in a position to do that? So the next model is uh, another well-known model. Oh, model three actually, sorry. Uh, you build it, you run it. Um, so in this case, for the purposes of the talk, we'll say this is akin to the famous Amazon two pizza team arrangement. You've a smallish team, they've developed a thing, they run a thing, and perhaps it's behind some kind of information hiding or PC interface. The, the important point from this um, point of view or the important attribute from this point of view is you keep all of the responsibility in house. So again, like every other model, it's got strengths and weaknesses. Um, the nice thing here, I suppose, about this model, set of nice things are, um, there's no avoiding feedback loops, right? You, you cannot hope to avoid in a systemic way the consequences of your own design decisions if you're on this team. Eventually the operations on call schedule will come around and you will, uh, you will learn uh, about uh, what it was, the, the value of the decisions and the implementation that you made um, earlier on. And that's a, that's a fantastic strength. Um, I mean, I hope I'm not alone in believing that well operable software is just kind of good software inherently. Um, but you also have in this model, the freedom to reinvent an implementation behind a designed interface. Now that's again, kind of flowing from the Amazon model that doesn't necessarily pertain in all circumstances, uh, but the you build it, you run that approach uh, does stimulate a sense of ownership, which can mean that the impetus organizationally to change implementations behind can be stronger than in the situation where ownership is partitioned. I'll say that rather than spread or diluted, but ownership is partitioned uh, and organizations can end up fighting each other about change. 
Uh, ownership also makes it easier to build career paths. I think it also makes people better engineers uh, because they have to think more about what they're doing and they get to see the whole life cycle of a thing. Uh, and sometimes when you're seeing a short window of a thing, you don't have enough time to build a strong model about what's going on and, and what, uh, what it means to be good at doing that thing and seeing it through to completion. And having said that, there are actually a number of weaknesses to the model as well. And I say hard to get past the OPC interface um, on the slide. Um, I suppose what I really mean is that teams that are far apart organizationally in this strong ownership, team level ownership model, uh, they almost never consolidate expertise, right? There's hardly any organizational benefit to them doing so or any real rationale. You've always got stuff to do in your own, uh, own domain. Uh, and what that leads to is, you know, 17 different teams reinventing key value bearer systems or bad backs up or whatever. It's kind of team optimal and company pessimal as a setup. If uh, duplication of effort is your thing and if scale of, of operation is your thing, it's not very good about that. And there are other questions as well, um, which I suppose can lead to weaknesses, um, such as if you didn't build it, uh, but you're told you have to run it anyway, um, that's also not great, uh, particularly for the people who have to do the running. Or what if possibly as a result of this, no one wants to run it. Uh, that model kind of works for an underlying set of uh, assumptions about software development and organizational competences, etc. cetera. Uh, and exceptional situations aren't necessarily handled by it very well. Another point I think um, possibly also related to uh, other conversations we're having in the industry about diversity of backgrounds and concerns and so on. A very, very coarse one I will use as an example here is uh, systems versus software um, development expertise. It can make it hard in the case where basically you have everyone on the team being a strong software engineer apart from somebody you've brought in to uh, with some particular strong piece of expertise can make it hard to reward the right behavior, um, depending on the, the situation and the context, of course. Uh, but my, my experience is that diversity can sometimes, diversity of background can sometimes be hard to facilitate in strongly focused ownership models. Um, and obviously questions uh, that are particularly relevant in the DevOps context or are, how is this model compatible with the no more silos? Basically isn't, right? It's silo generating, um, like many other things. Uh, and how easy is it to share expertise? Um, obviously a decision maker might say, you know, how much does that matter to the, to the company overall? Um, but my my sense is that when reliability is a concern, that kind of thing does really matter quite a lot. Um, other questions are, is the right mix of people on the team? Can they be kept on it? And so on. Not all of these are exclusive questions to the strong ownership model, but I, I think they're uh, definitely related. So talk a little bit about the SRE model. Um, for the purposes of this conversation, I fully and completely accept it can be done in a, uh, a million different ways. But for the purpose of this conversation, I'll say uh, an SRE model is a, a separate organization in terms of reporting chain with expertise and kind of shared systems, reliability and uh, domain specific concerns like that. But they partner with the product development team very closely. Um, so this model also has strengths and weaknesses. Um, it is a good way, a, a separate organization that's not driven by pure feature concerns is a good way to keep people working on reliability even during times of feature pressure. So it's a good way of raising the floor on a, uh, a system and making sure that the worst outcomes can't happen uh, 
to the extent that they would flow from people taking their eye off the ball. Um, and it's a emerging, exciting job role. So um, lots of people are interested in it and want to do it. Uh, weaknesses, um, obviously I'm very biased in my approach here, uh, but I'd say that there's a, a, a lot of people say that there's a question mark around the scale that you can get that kind of thing to operate in, like you have to be a large company in order to do it. Um, personally speaking, I don't know about that. I've done a few talks on how it's possible to be um, an SRE as a small company and SRE Con has a number of talks like that as well. I think being reliability minded is a thing which can happen no matter what your job title is or no matter what company you work at. Uh, and I think that's more fundamental than whatever we call the, the job role or hire a person as. Um, and I think another weakness of the model is that if there's literally no shared systems between the teams, then um, having, we're relying on relatively generic expertise about reliability and transferring between teams is more or less the same as hiring a new person. And uh, maybe that's less good for the, the company as a whole. Um, also a number of questions we can ask uh, about maybe existing implementations of SRE uh, within a company or planned implementations of SRE. You know, a very, um, a very famous one would be, is your SRE team actually an SRE team with the authority to do what's right? Or is it a renamed uh, other department with nothing else changed? Uh, that's uh, happened a number of times in the world. Um, and starting a new SRE team obviously involves significant disruption, particularly when authority is kind of being uh, dil diluted or spread, shared, probably the right word, rather than partitioned. Um, anyway, it often involves significant disruption. So do you have bottom-up and top-down support for what you're doing because you'll need both? Um, are you in a position, harking back to the previous definition, to understand the appropriate level of reliability for your systems, do enough people want it, that level of reliability? Uh, so all of them, good questions to, to ask. But now uh, to finish up, just want to talk a little bit about uh, one of my favorite books, um, Switch, How to, to Change Things When Change is Hard by Chip and Dan Heath. I uh, strongly recommend uh, if you are involved in change within an organization of, of more or less any kind, you give this a read. Um, I find a very positive, motivating read with a lot of um, successful stories and uh, interesting things to, to learn in it. Um, certainly my interpretation is that more or less anyone in the DevOps world is interest in change, organizational change, one kind or another um, in, a, in a way that maybe other folks aren't. Um, but anyway, in this book, and again, I, sh I should start off by saying that there are very, very many change management models in the world uh, and in books and in academia and so on. And there's uh, even an article in the SRE workbook about change management which makes reference to a number of these things. Um, but in the, the change model world, like the number one question really is how do you get things to change? And in this book, they talk about how when you're trying to drive a change, you need to get the, the heart and the head and the environment cooperating for actual sustained kind of change that, that sticks really. Um, you have to address things in the emotional domain and you have to address things in the kind of rational or intellectual domain uh, in order to get stuff to, to stay. Uh, in the emotional domain, I suppose, habitual behaviors, um, the idea of collegiate or kind of group membership and identity. Who am I? What am I? What is my role? I think of myself as a Blah, which will make it hard for me to do this other thing over here. Uh, the fact that psychologically speaking, um, there's some good results, uh, or I should say strong evidence suggesting that uh, human beings are very loss 
avert, uh, loss-oriented, loss-sensitive. Um, so if you're taking something away from them, they'll react much more strongly than if you give them uh, something um, bizarrely, but it's apparently true. Uh, communication as well, um, that could also go under the uh, rational domain heading there as well, but good communication to the individuals involved and repetitious communication and so on are all um, completely necessary for any kind of decent size change um, project or even any change project at all really. You also need to address things in the, the more rational domain. And I feel that by default, many organizations end up kind of defaulting to, we will tackle this in the rational domain and we will fix the incentive structures and we will change the organizational structures, hooray, reorg, uh, and we'll have a new strategy and direction and uh, the document in which we'll explain everything. Uh, and what we often end up finding is that if you don't couple these together while also tackling the question of the larger environment, um, then your change project is much slower or doesn't go anywhere. And I suppose one of the, the main techniques, we'll talk a bit more uh, about the techniques in a moment, but one of the main techniques I've been uh, mentioning throughout this presentation is asking questions. How do you ask appropriate questions in the appropriate way? And in many circumstances, particularly when environments are kind of low trust or loss averse or similar, um, you have to ask questions about where an organization is and why it's doing what it's doing in a non-threatening, but kind of energetic way uh, in order to, to start folks thinking about what they're doing and why they're doing it, but not in a way which is going to cause them to want to block something. Um, so you need to be non-threatening, but energetic. And so one interesting way to do that is to, to be value oriented and talk about benefit to the, the customer because uh, that's an argument that it's kind of hard to hard to comprehensively fight against I suppose and uh, certainly be seen to be doing the right thing. There are other uh, techniques as well. Uh, one of the ones I mentioned in the book is to encourage bright spots more or less on, on any scale, like maybe not the very, very tiniest, but in, a, in an organization, in a team even, there's usually places where the right things are happening. Uh, and you need to connect those places or those people and advertise those uh, widely around the, the teams, the org, etc., in order to help create momentum for a change. Uh, another key point is that smaller programs are usually nimbler and more resilient than kind of boil the ocean style projects. You may have a boil the ocean style transformation in mind um, on any level really, uh, but you're probably best off starting with local value, like value delivered close to a team uh, with committed individuals um, and an experiment that's easy to start and in the minds of others easy to, to change or stop if it seemed to be not working, but delivering value um, quickly is good. Another point probably um, oriented towards the communication piece is making changes concrete and shrinking them. So you have to be as specific as possible about what the future looks like on a, on a per team basis. Um, as specific as makes sense really, uh, because not for, it won't necessarily be clear for every team, um, but you have to be as upfront about it as you possibly can. And also making the intermediate steps uh, easier and shorter, often by having somebody kind of in, interpret or break down the steps between the glorious future and the uncertain now, uh, and add uh, those concrete steps with kind of rough timelines. Like usually, people will buy into something even if not all of the i's are dotted and t's are crossed uh, as long as you have a, a reasonably articulated version of the future and some semi-plausible steps in how to get there i mean 
you know, we work in software, we're used to things not working, used to things changing rapidly. And, and most people would recognize that. Um, but going the extra mile uh, to do those things can, can win you a lot of support. And also a very important lesson that ambiguity causes hesitation, causes people to go, well, what is the highest priority actually? You told us X and then you told us Y and then you told us Z and somebody turned around the other day and said it might be A. Ambiguity causes hesitation. So you need to communicate frequently, even the bad things, possibly especially the bad things. And people have a much larger chance of figuring out in their own local context uh, what it is that they should do. So just to end uh, with the summary, so approaches to implementing reliability mindset in your software and systems and um, almost always involves dealing with people uh, and often changing their minds and behavior. Uh, and people have models about how the world works and how the process of software development works and how software is done, which drives their reactions to change, proposed changes to uh, to how work is conducted. Uh, and a lot of those models are actually somewhat or mostly on an intellectual level of some kind, but people also have emotions about things, feelings about things, and their emotions make them do things, react in particular ways, etc. So you can change what models people use by examining the strengths and weaknesses of them in a relatively neutral way, in an open way, and asking good questions about the cost and benefit. And a successful change project involves emotional negotiation, intellectual support, and environmental hacking. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, super interesting, honestly. Uh, it was really, uh, just a personal level for me, very interesting to see how the discussion around these subjects has uh, evolved, certainly from, from your standpoint, but also from an industry standpoint over time. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to say before we dive into the Q&A, sir? Yeah, I suppose the first thing to say is thank you to the DevOps Days folks for their extraordinarily good AV support, which swooped in and saved the day at the, not the last moment, the couple of moments before the last moment, but uh, very much appreciated. Excellent. Well, I'm sure they appreciate that. And, and of course, uh, this is, it's tricky stuff, right? So that they were able to respond that quickly, I suppose, is a testament to DevOps practices to a certain degree. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, one of your slides, you were talking about, uh, talking about features and ways of determining whether features were all equally valid. Just curious, what would be some ways to make those determinations? You, you posited the question. I'd be interested to know if you have potential answers to it. Uh, sure. I suppose the number one thing to say is that uh, when you've been in uh, a number of large organizations, uh, as I have large software oriented organizations, um, you get to understand that different organizations can have pretty different ways of, uh, of ranking things and ranking the success of things. And uh, often smaller organizations or startups don't have that kind of luxury. It's about the dollars. We get the dollars in the door and that's a success or we don't get the dollars and that's a failure. Uh, but more or less when you're beyond the immediate uh, kind of we need to get the dollars in the door and nothing else matters, uh, you end up having a very large array of things that you could use to judge the validity of features. And they they can be stuff like infrastructure work, scaling for future success, sorry, uh, or um, adoption, uh, scaling of adoption, which drives product growth so that then you can later turn on the dollar tap uh, more effectively than you could if you just turned it on earlier and so on. Like there's actually a very large variety of those. And I think the point about the, the paper uh, that I was talking about, the online experimentation paper, is that actually uh, none of these ways are really very good. <laughs> uh, maybe the truth is in between or a combination of these, or you have to figure out what works in your own situation or similar weasel words, right? Right. 
That's that's good. Yeah, uh, and that, that's fair. And I appreciate that. And that sounds like an honest answer, <laughs> which I appreciate certainly. Uh, so we had a couple of questions coming in on Slido. So thank you everybody on the YouTube chat for using Slido to get some questions in, so you don't have to listen to my inane ones. Uh, so we'll throw you an easy one to start with. Uh, are you working on a new book, sir? <laughs> um, as it happens, yes. Uh, the one that is in the works at the moment has an AI flavor, uh, but I won't say too much more because it hasn't been totally signed off on yet, but that's something we're looking at. Very good. Uh, this talk in particular, one of the uh, people here was curious, was it inspired by your work at or with Azure? Or is this kind of your own imagination? Um, it's, uh, it's definitely inspired by the work I've been doing for the past couple of years because I've been spending almost all my time thinking about organizational style issues, uh, organizational questions, incentives, etc. Um, and also management of, of people, uh, but really trying to drive change in fast moving, very strongly growing organizations. Um, so I, I suppose, as I said in the talk, my intuition, hopefully it's true, is that a lot of DevOps folks find themselves in transition or in change projects or in trying to agitate for no more silos, et cetera, and they have that component to their thinking and that model of the world or modeling the world uh, in a way that maybe not all software professionals do. Uh, so I, I, I was hoping that some of the, that discussion about what change takes to do would resonate with some of the audience. Absolutely. Uh, so we have time, I think, for one more question, depending on the length of the answer here. Uh, and this one I actually wanted to call out because I have it as well. We talked about different, you talked about rather, different models, different ways of organizing, different ways of thinking about uh, you know, how, how to do work and how to value work. Is it necessary for a single organization to use only one model or can an organization implement multiple models? And then I actually want to add on a little bit to that, which is, is it possible to have hybrid models? Are these things mutually exclusive? Great question. Um, so by inspection, I think is probably the way I would, I would put it, um, the larger the company is, the harder it is to have a more consistent approach to what you're doing, uh, particularly because as uh, I suppose as path distance increases from some central definition of something, you get stuff around the periphery that's a bit uh, different uh, and so on. I think my native prejudice is that SRE models tend to benefit more from consistency of approach and consistency of execution uh, than the other models. In particular, you build it, you run it, uh, is very strongly locally scoped. And sometimes that can be totally finance what you what you want. The difficulty, as I said in the talk, is that sometimes when you're trying to stitch together the you build it, you run it uh, teams, each of whom are executing with local optimality, you're trying to impedance match between things that can actually be very different. Uh, and so my my personal preference, I suppose, is that uh, an SRE model where where individual teams are are varying more, but there's a central core of principles and a central body of knowledge which can be transmitted around and consolidated is really the, the best of all possible worlds. Fantastic. All right, so we're actually perfectly at time, as if it were scripted. <laughs> a, a big thank you again, honestly, for, for coming through this evening, sharing your knowledge and your experience with us, being willing to run the gauntlet of a live Q&A. Uh, a big round of applause, virtual applause, real world applause uh, for Niall. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, so for everybody who's following along at home, and we hope you are, uh, we have a short break. We will resume in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, this is going to be 8.10 Kiev time. That whatever time that means to you. So in about 10 minutes. Now, we encourage you to go check out one of those uh, breakout rooms if you're interested in uh, hanging out and getting to know some of your fellow conference attendees. And that's gonna be in the YouTube chat if you're looking for those links. Of course, you can also just 
chill out yourself, right? Uh, again, we're going to be back in about 10 minutes. Stay tuned.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you had a pleasant break. I hope you had an opportunity to check out one of the Zoom hangout rooms. I know I did. We had a good time. Uh, if you didn't, that's also fine. Your time is, of course, your own. Uh, before we continue, just want to let you know that the music that you may have heard before the stream started and that you're hearing in between sessions is written by a fellow engineer and a member of the Ukrainian DevOps community. His name is Roman Slipchenko. I hope I am pronouncing that name correctly, and my apologies if I'm not. So thank you for providing the excellent tunes for us today. All right. Next up, very, very important, sponsors, right? <laughs> so I'd like to introduce our sponsor for today. Uh, Perimatch Tech is a high-tech R&D center uh, of the global holding company, Perimatch. Perimatch Tech is an innovative provider of future-defining tech solutions in the gaming and entertainment industry. They are committed to innovation and provide the global community with high-quality betting products and a high-quality gaming experience. They have solutions and innovative approaches that drive the company forward in the gaming market, and they remain as basis for success and continued development. Perimatch Tech is an in-depth synergy of technology, business, and sport. I would like to introduce ooh, Sir Hai Kalinets. And again, I apologize if I have messed that name up. Welcome to the stream. Hi, my name is Serhii Kalinets. I'm technical architect in Parimash Tech. And today I want to talk about the tools that I'm using in my day-to-day -day work. This is a teaser video, so I will just name all these tools. And uh, if you register to this event, you will get the link to the full video when I will show these tools in action. The first one is uh, on my Z shell. On my Z shell is basically a customization framework for Z shell that allows you to add thousands or maybe hundreds of plugins and themes to your Z shell installation. I'm using Antigen to manage these plugins. And uh, if you're talking about the themes, I tried many of them, but each, each uh, required some manual tweaks, some configuration, and I'm too lazy to do all this configuration. And recently I found the very cool theme. It names is uh, Power Level 10K. And th this one is a key killer for me because I just installed it, made some simple choices and got everything that I, I wanted. Next thing is Tmux. Tmux is basically a console multiplexer that allows you to split your one terminal into m multiple panes, windows. Tmux is a console multiplexer that allows you to split a terminal into multiple sessions, windows and panes, and you can see more than one session at one time. This capability are usually provided by tools like iTerm2 or so on, but I think that Tmux is a better option because you can use it everywhere, even in very old school uh, terminal and when you connect to remote servers. So Tmux is definitely a thing. Next thing is a uh, bat. Bat is basically a clone of the cat utility that allows you to see files with uh, syntax highlighting and uh, it just adds more color to your console when you are looking at files. Next in our list is a uh, rib grab. This is just a grab but with some uh, improvements they say that it works faster and it's de definitely easy to invoke because you need to type only two le letters RG instead of grab and it supports regular expression and all the stuff that we use uh, when we search and stuff in, in the files. Let's move to the next one. This is a diff utility. The name is uh, self-telling, diff so fancy. And diff so fancy is uh, the differ that adds some colors and uh, useful and pretty uh, output. And if you install it, it integrates with Git. And Gits are looking much better than by default. One of my favorites is a utility that I cannot pronounce in this uh, session, so we will name it F-word. So this is basically a, a thing that fixes your errors when you type different commands. So for example, you do git commit, but instead of double M in commit, you type only one M and git returns an error. And instead of fixing it, 
you just type this F word and it will fix uh, your input automatically. It also can help with adding sudo in the beginning of and uh, fixes many various errors. The next uh, killer utility is uh, Zjump. Zjump is used to navigate to locations or directories that are most frequently using. So if you perform some work in your work directory or you have some projects that you r recently need to navigate to, you can just type Z and the part of the name and you will get right there without any complex trying to uh, re remember in which folder this uh, location is, the full path and so on. FD is uh, my replacement for find command. When I need to find some files, uh, usually I cannot remember all the syntax of the options of find command. You need to provide the type of uh, entry you need to find, like uh, whether it, it, it's a file or a directory or so on. FD has much simpler syntax uh, and it provides the same capability as find command. And also it's easy to involve because it has only two letters. So I using uh, FD to look through my files. However, I have even better option for looking through files and not only files, and this is FZF. FZF is a fuzzy finder. This is awesome piece of software written on Go, and it allows you to filter through m different lists, mainly files, but it could be anything. It could be git commit, it could be processes, it could be some handles and whatever. It is very flexible, it can be injected into any pipeline, it has integration with Vim, it can be integrated with existing tools, and uh, this is really a game changer when you are working with stuff in console. This is uh, all for the, for the list, and if you register to this event, you will get the link to the full video when I will show these tools in action. Excellent. So uh, that was uh, informative, but also really short. If you're interested actually in checking out the full length video on that, sir, he goes into a ton of great tooling uh, and, and system administration type stuff. Check out the link in the video description on the YouTube channel. It's right there. You can go check that out. You can sign up, you can win some prizes. It's a lot of fun. Also, I should point out that Sirhi is uh, a pretty popular and active speaker at IT conferences all over the place. So .NET, XP Days, uh, DevOps Fest, he coaches and does engineering practices, and he's currently doing system architecture work over at uh, Perimatch Tech. So if you are interested in talking with a specialist in the domain, he's your man. All right, so let's continue. I am genuinely proud to introduce Liz. It's one of the most famous influencers in the site reliability, engineering, and observability spaces. She's one of the key people who made the SRE community so unicorn unique. A big round of applause for Liz. Hello, thanks for having me on for DevOps Days Kiev. I'm really glad that I could be joining you virtually. So um, I'd like to start off with a riff on a nursery rhyme that we have in the US. I'm not sure whether people read Dr. Seuss uh, in Ukraine, but uh, this, is, this is the uh, rhyme. Uh, congratulations, today is your day. You're off to observability, you're off and away. You have brains in your head, you have hands on keyboard, you can steer yourself any direction you go toward. But what direction should we go toward as people who are developing systems. As Niall said in the talk right before mine, there's definitely a lot of concern over making sure that we're building the right things. And once upon the time, Niall and I both worked at a company that duplicated a lot of work. There were 20 ways to do anything. There were 20 ways to run your commands inside of a homegrown Kubernetes environment. There were 20 ways to add monitoring to your software. And everyone cared about mottos like fanatical support or focused on the user first and all else will follow. But 
that's really challenging and hard to do when you can't see into your systems and you can't understand the impact of what you're doing. So this road to happiness turns out to actually be taking you towards pain if you don't set the right incentives for you and for your team. That if you're setting the wrong incentives and promoting people for building things that don't actually add value, then you're creating a lot of problems. Organizations tend to do things like have an attitude of, if this wasn't invented here, it's not good enough for us. That nothing else could possibly solve my problem because I am some kind of special snowflake. And maybe if you're Google, the answer might be, okay, we need to build one new way of doing things, but surely we don't need to build one new thing for every team at Google, never mind for the entire industry. People also wind up doing things like building projects that are only for the purpose of getting a promotion or for making it look good on their resume. We have too much autonomy almost over the tools that we're building and that causes us to waste our time. Or the flip side of that is also disempowering. If you have too little autonomy over what you're building, because people are telling you, just trust the consultants, use whatever people tell you to use, where people feel like they don't have control and the ability to make their teams and working environments better. Today, I want to tell you that there is a better way to think about building software as a DevOps team and building software specifically in the domain of observability, as well as around automation, many of the other things that we care about in terms of culture automation uh, process and measurement. So what's our goal as DevOps engineers? What's our goal as site reliability engineers? Our goal is to make sure that our products have appropriate reliability and scalability that our products are delighting users and that we're able to ship fast enough and to ship them what they need and have them be able to depend upon the tools that, they're, that we're giving them. So this often takes the form of making sure that not just that our machines are appropriately scalable, but also making sure that our people are appropriately scalable, that we're not baking in too much complexity to the point that our people can no longer keep up. We should make sure that no team has to do too much ops, not just, you know, hey, my software development team shouldn't do ops, let's push that on to the call center, right? Like, no, we need to make sure that everyone has to do the right amount of operations. This doesn't mean we do no operations, right? We have to have some exposure to production to understand what the requirements are in production to make sure that we're building things that are informed by what the production experience is. So it's this constant trade-off between essential complexity relevant to the features we're building versus getting rid of unnecessary complexity that has crept in, which is also known as technical debt. So we need to have service level objectives, which are covered in the Site Reliability Engineering book. But to summarize SLOs really quickly, this notion of appropriate reliability and scalability revolves around defining as a product requirement, what is our objective? Are we aiming for 99% reliability, 99.9% .9 reliability? And how exactly are we measuring it? So once you've done that, you also need to think about what appropriate observability is for your system. Your observability requirements are probably much higher stakes if you're operating a three or four nine service than if you're operating a two nine service. You really need that control loop over your data in order to understand and be able to debug those novel cases in production to understand why is my system behaving the way that it is? Can I take it apart and understand what's happening without having to push new code? This is not the logs, metrics, or tra and or traces that you use uh, for instrumentation. This is instead that broader socio-technical capability of can we understand based off of the data that we have and our mental capabilities and our tools. It's also not just the notion of break fix or repairing things once they're broken. We do need operational resilience, it's true, but we also need to think about pushing things left, shifting that effort left so that we get observability into our code as we're developing it so that we can adopt not just test-driven development, but observability-driven development, even before the code gets checked in. So that we can understand, as our code progresses through a continuous integration delivery pipeline, where is it getting bogged down? Why is my CI-CD pipeline slow? Why is it flaky? And even better, can we get insight into what users are doing with the features that we're building, so that we can measure and know if our projects are having a positive impact in delivering return on investment?
And can we understand and proactively manage that technical debt so that we understand what are the dark, scary areas of our system that we need to improve, that we need to streamline? As I alluded to earlier, observability is not just the data. Observability is the broader capability. Do we have the right ability to add the correct instrumentation to our code in an ergonomic fashion? Is it as easy to add the appropriate observability as it would be to add a printf debug line? Can we stream that data to a data source that is easy to use, that is easy to maintain, and doesn't suck up all of your time, <coughs> elk? <coughs> and do you have the ability to make it scale cost effectively without eating your entire budget? And then can you query it, both from a technical perspective, is your data storage engine capable of generating the responses to your questions about continuous data delivery, about operational performance, or is it limited to a fixed set of questions? And do you, as an individual person using the system, feel you're empowered to do so rather than just using a finite set of dashboards? Are you, as an operator of the system, able to go and dive into that data? So we need to make sure that we as a team that builds tools, because DevOps teams get their highest leverage through building tools, are we taking ourselves out of the picture? Can product development teams successfully push code without needing to talk to us? We are a scaling limit ourselves, so don't make systems that depend upon cloning yourself. We need to make sure that as we engineer observability and broadly automation systems in general, that we're making sure that we're engineering for all teams and not just shoveling work onto other teams or help desks. That reinforces the bad days from before DevOps. And moreover, engineering is not just the art of writing software, it's the art of maintaining and cultivating and, build, and building the broader capabilities on top of existing software. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve here? Um, we are trying to solve this problem of getting so much software duplicated. How can we fix this? Well, we can change the incentives. We can, instead of rewarding people for doing the wrong things, reward people for doing the right things. If I come to you and say, hey, look at this thing that I threw together with duct tape, you should look at me askance and say, hey, Liz, maybe you should tell me not about the kind of cool thing you duct taped, but instead, you should look at the actual success case, right? Like, what was the problem that we solved? How were we successful? You know, how did we get to this problem, right? What, what was the situation and context around it? What did we try, including the dead ends? How did we actually solve it, right? Like, what are the solution pieces that can be reused by other people? And how did we actually make an impact on our teams? Did we streamline the workflow and save 30 minutes off of every deploy, making every developer much more productive, right? That's impact, not writing 100 lines of code or 1,000 lines of code. So look left and right first before building. Don't necessarily jump straight to writing code. And don't glorify creating complexity. It used to be at Google that the job ladder said, you get promoted from level three software engineer to level four software engineer if you have the right amount of complexity in your design docs and complexity in your code. Turns out that incentivizes people to build throwaway projects that wind up adding complexity to the software ecosystem and not actually solving problems. So remember, open source exists. You can borrow from open source or just adopt it wholesale. Your coworkers code exists. Don't build the same things 20 times over. Maybe if you're Google, three times is enough to account for all possible use cases within the company, but you're probably not Google. And vendors exist. Is this a strategic advantage to my company to be building this? If only I can build it, then I should build it. But if this is something that anyone else could do, let other people do it. Let them special. So you may be sitting here saying, okay, Liz, this is... I cannot tell you what to do. Your situation individually is unique. But here are some of the questions that I might help you with if you came to one of my office hours. I might ask you not just what problem are you solving, but you know things like what problem are customers having? Your customers are probably not complaining that they have too few dashboards and they need more dashboards. Sometimes the customer is you, in fact, sometimes the customer is your own team, sometimes it's an engineering team, sometimes it's end users. But regardless, you need to hear from end users. And specifically in the domain of observability, 
we are not just trying to uh, do metrics and traces, right? Like metrics and traces are not the goal, right? They're not the, they're not the how, right? We need to focus on why. Why are people having a problem and how can we help them solve it? Don't dive in too deeply into implementation details. Developers moving faster is our goal as DevOps and SRE teams. That's how we wind up thinking about serving our end users best. So think, why, why, why? Why are users having problems? And then after that, how can we fix it? Who's going to run the solution that we build? We have to think about, you know, is this something that's going to become crusty over time because too many different teams are running it and each running into trouble? Who's going to maintain it in the code and product sense, right? You have to make sure that it's not a collection of random features, that it's a coherent product with a maintained code base. And what options are we considering? And think a lot about, you know, reuse, open source, vendor, or build new. And a shout out here, for instance, to Etsy, one of the e-commerce vendors in the US that chose Google Cloud Platform over Amazon and Azure and explained in detail in a public blog post so that other people wouldn't have to repeat that work. And it's okay to have not just one thing solve it, but you have to think through the options, right? You have to decide, you know what? I can build this correctly out of two existing things rather than building a third thing myself. So adapt an existing solution or two. Sometimes the right answer is build on more than one thing or extend something existing rather than starting from scratch. Remember that writing new code ultimately winds up creating technical debt, especially if it's bespoke. But if you upstream that code and make it part of the broader community effort, then it becomes an easier lift for everyone to maintain. Don't be that end-named finance company in New York that maintains its own Kubernetes fork. That's just ridiculous. Running software, as we know as operations professionals, is technical debt. Who's patching it? Who's keeping it up to date? This is why software as a service is so, so, so helpful. Because it means that one set of people is running software for many different companies instead of each company running the software itself. As Niall said in this talk, a third of projects wind up being net negative for a company. They generate negative value because they've built the wrong thing and it's ruinous. If you're a startup like Honeycomb, we're a company that has 30 employees and has received less than $30 million of funding. If we build the wrong thing, that could sink the company. So how can we avoid that mistake? Well, we have to collaborate with the broader DevOps and observability community. We have to listen first. We have to do user studies. We have to approach the art of site reliability engineering and DevOps engineering as a product management concern. Are we gathering product requirements and doing user studies before we actually start building? Are we looking around for similar problems that have already been solved? And if we made sure that we're not closing off avenues to build and extend, even if we're not necessarily building that scope today. So focus on extendability without diving into feature creep. And maybe you'll find existing solutions by looking left and right before you actually start building. The other thing that we can really do to empower users is to document things and provide examples once we've built something. And that applies even if we haven't personally built it. If you adopt an existing open source technology and you work at a company, document how FastCo uses FUBAR because other people will rely on that and be able to avoid duplicating that work. Documentation includes working examples. People copy the first instance they find of a working application. So make sure that your examples are good or else they'll set people down the wrong path when they copy a outdated sample application. And really focus on upskilling and training each other. A active users community is a real force multiplier. For instance, Honeycomb, my employer, has a company called has a, a Slack community called Pollinators, where we learn from each other, where users help each other, and where they contribute open source fixes. That way, people feel empowered to improve and extend the tools that they work on, rather than treating them as black boxes. User confusion is really, really costly. You know, it's not just a matter of writing good documentation. It's not a matter of oh, there's a workaround for that, right? Like, make sure that people know that they're empowered to make things better and that we're going to streamline things to reduce confusion. So this was a problem that we faced in the observability community. We had competing products. We had open census and open tracing that were both competing with each other as well as with proprietary solutions. And people had no idea which one they should adopt. But we simplified. We decided that we were going to found a new project called Open Telemetry to consolidate both of these standards and put it under the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. 
And that way people were learning about how we could work together, even as our companies were competing to provide solutions. So now there are dozens of different companies that are all contributing to this, ranging from vendors to end users to open source communities that are all making open telemetry better, allowing both the users and the providers of telemetry solutions and of, of observability solutions to make their lives better so that they only need to instrument once. They only need to write the instrumentation for open standards and open libraries once. And that way everyone has an easier time getting visibility into their projects. So share with your community. Yes, like the set of people here, talk about your wins. Let's celebrate our wins. Let's use the same language and APIs to talk about kind of what are the technologies that we're using? What are the problems that we're solving? And make sure that we're not constantly renaming what we do. Don't dump hacks on the community, right? Do not treat the community as a dumping ground. Instead, we need to say, this is what something is useful for. This is what the right solution is in my case, and this is whether or not it's the right thing for you. Don't let people waste their time evaluating something that's just not going to work for them. And upstream your code and specifications. Don't maintain separate forks. If you publish a open source project, make sure that there's more than one stakeholder so that it's not just a single company project. A single company project is doomed to failure. Eventually that company will go under and then nobody will be able to maintain it anymore. So make sure that you have a ecosystem built around your open source project. Document what you build and why you've built it that way. Have RFCs or, uh, or, or technical design documents to explain kind of what we did, why we did it, and why our decision might be subject to change in the future. Overall though, what I'm here to tell you is that you don't have to be a hero in order to operate a successful DevOps team. You just need to make sure that you have the ability to build software in a sustainable way that's documented, is supported by the community so that you can choose to move on and take a new job, to go on parental leave. The world should be able to go on without us. So automate away your previous job. Here's what happens if we do it well. If you do things well, then you'll have a very low change fail rate. You'll have a low time to restore service. You'll be able to ship code quicker. But unfortunately, a lot of the industry is falling behind. From 2018 to 2019, the number of low to medium performers actually increased rather than decreased year on year. Last year, for instance, there were 52% uh, of, uh, of teams at software organizations that were medium to low performers. This year, there were 56%, right? Like that number is unfortunately going up. However, we're doing a great job as people who are connected with this DevOps community of helping upskill people from high to elite performers. It's just that that movement is mostly still within the medium to low performance space. So let's reach out to people who are not involved in the DevOps community and get them involved with the DevOps community. Teach them what we know. Teach them what we know about build and unit tests being really essential. Teach them what you've just learned about observability being really, really key to understanding what's happening inside of your systems to reduce your time to resolve incidents. So here's our story at Honeycomb. A dozen engineers are responsible for building Honeycomb. And we're a product that serves in the, in the uh, millions of events per, per hour, right? Like we're, we're a system that manages to ingest data at scale. We help software teams make their systems humane to run by ingesting your telemetry and helping you get insights into what's happening inside your system so you feel empowered to fix issues and be proactive. Observability is our superpower and we hope it becomes your superpower too. Yes, we deploy on Fridays. We deploy every single day of the week, work week, Monday through Friday, and we are able to take weekends off without emergency pushes. This is our real deployment frequency. We deploy a dozen times per day. And when there is a problem, we're able to push changes within three hours for a routine change and we're able to push code every single hour with only one or two new commits per build artifact. If there is something that we need to fix, we can often fix it forward, but if not, we can do flag flips and emergency rollbacks are only needed 0.1% of the time. Less than one in a thousand changes catastrophically fail for us. And flag flipping takes less than 30 seconds. Pushing a previous build takes less than 10 minutes and our continuous delivery system is set up so that we can fix forward in less than 20 minutes. So high productivity product engineering is enabled by continuous integration, continuous delivery, flag flips, and high degrees of observability so we can understand immediately when something's gone wrong in production. 
you too can do this. You just need the right building blocks. You need CI and CD, obviously, and you need the right set of telemetry. You need things like open telemetry in order to help you get that data baked into your application code and sent to the right set of data, uh, data syncs for analysis. So I'd encourage you to check out open telemetry. And I'd also encourage you to think about the overall big picture. How can you write less software by building off of open source tooling and using software as a service in order to empower you to focus on what really matters? Look around you, evaluate things, collaborate with the community and share what, what you learn with the community. For any of you who are having trouble viewing my slides earlier, they're at honeycomb.io slash Liz, or you can scan that QR code on your screen now. I'll also put it in the YouTube chat. And thank you very much. I welcome your questions. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, that was a very high speed talk through a ton of material. Uh, I don't even know where to begin on the q and I, I was furiously taking notes, to be honest with you. So uh, while we uh, give a moment for the community in the YouTube chat to hit up uh, Slido, and again, if you want to ask Liz a question, it's in the YouTube chat, the link, go to Slido, uh, feel free to ask a question. Uh, I'll kick us off here. And I'm going to kick us off right at the very end. The CI, CD pipeline and procedures uh, you were describing, that sounds great, uh, darn near magical. Can you provide any insight into what's going on behind the scenes there. Yeah, I absolutely can. So I think that the key element of our CI and CD process has been actually adding distributed tracing to our CI CD system. Uh, we have a library for that called Build Events that's integrated with things like Jack and Dex, Circle CI, uh, Travis CI, that adds kind of start and end markers to every step of our build process so we can see what the bottleneck is and reduce that bottleneck. So we know, right, like if a step is, is taking 30 seconds, reducing it to 15 seconds doesn't make a big difference, whereas take a step that takes 10 minutes, we can reduce to five minutes and really dramatically cut our time to build. So that's kind of one approach that we've taken. The other approach that we've taken has been being really, really attentive to build failures, right? Like to make sure that we don't have flaky tests, that we often don't need to rerun tests, and that enables us to do that hourly push with minimal lead time because we have high confidence in our tests without needing to do manual testing and the tests run quickly and they're, and they're able to produce golden artifacts that we're immediately able to deploy. So I think that's kind of how we get to that hourly push, right? Like is making sure that those tests are high fidelity and that we've instrumented them to make sure that they run quickly enough. You, you almost make it sound too easy. <laughs> but no, that's great insight. Thank you. Uh, right, like I, honestly, I think it's kind it's of excellent. interesting. You know, people think that uh, Honeycomb, you know, employs super elite engineers, right? It's about the team. It's not about the individuals, right? It's about our processes and about what we prioritize as an organization. Uh, fantastic. That sounds great. <laughs> so we got some questions coming in from the uh, the Q and A, the Slido uh, one here. It's well upvoted. Uh, this should be fairly straightforward. Is flag flip? the same as a feature switch or a feature toggle? Yes, that's correct. It's a, it's, it's a uh, feature toggle, yep. So we happen to use LaunchDarkly. We really love LaunchDarkly, um, but you can also use tools like Mode. You can also use, uh, use kind of other, other tools. Excellent. Another plus one for LaunchDarkly, by the way. They're doing great work over there. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, what would you, Liz? recommend on where to start with uh, improving your observability? What would be the first steps? Yeah, I think the first step is really kind of moving away from just logging things with log verbose spew. Um, you kind of want to apply structure to your logs. You kind of want to make sure that you are emitting JSON logs rather than kind of free text, that you're emitting no more than one log line per kind of request through a microservice, right? So kind of combining those discrete log events into wide events. And then once they're kind of wide events, you know, one per event flowing through a microservice, uh, each with kind of discrete fields, like, you know, the HTTP code is broken out separately from the user ID is broken separate out from the request ID is broken separate out from the kind of request status, right? Like once you break those things out, then it's easy to feed them into a tool like Honeycomb, for instance, or Jaeger, or, you know, anything basically using open, open telemetry, right? That enables you to get that more robust uh, data analytics and then eventually build distributed tracing on it, right? Like, because once you have a kind of wide event, it's easy to say, this is the parent ID. Um, so a lot of that work has been done for you 
if you adopt open telemetry or similar, because it means that kind of that instrumentation library has been thought out. Uh, it's a relatively uh, easier API to use than trying to invent it yourself. That's why, you know, in my talk, I focus on, you know, not inventing it yourself. Um, so I think, I think that's that. And I think uh, also I'll put a link in the chat um, that talks a little about that process of improving observability, transforming from logging into, into tracing. Excellent. Uh, and uh, again, plus one on that one, uh, strong advice there. Do not try to write your own version of open telemetry. Down that path lies madness. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I have to say, you know, thank you to Datadog for donating your automatic instrumentation libraries, right? Like, you know, that kind of is very much in the spirit of let's not write auto instrumentation five times over, you know, thank you Datadog for donating that to open telemetry. We're all richer as a result of it. That, that literally the idea. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, so I've got, I've got a more I've got a couple questions actually uh, that I'd like to just for my own edification. So I'm going to use my soapbox here. Uh, you mentioned you had a slide on on what did we try, and documenting yeah. what was tried and and how that went. I'm just curious what if any are some techniques, processes, or strategies for discovering what was tried and recording what was tried and, and having an honest discussion about those determinations? Mm, I think that it's super great to write down not just the results of, of successful experiments, but failed experiments. Um, for instance, I tried this month long project about a year ago to run our Kafka brokers with uh, solid state drives as their primary storage and having uh, hard disks as their backup uh, storage using kind of a warm cache approach. And it backfired extremely badly, right? Like, you know, we discovered there that the median latency was great, the 99th percentile latency was awful, right? And that it was slow enough to stop our Kafka from processing at the correct speed to maintain the quality of uh, customer experience, right? But I meticulously wrote down the results of that experiment and put them in design docs that anyone else who followed along could see why did we pick, you know, a certain size of instance, right? So we, de we decided we were going to move off of Amazon EBS, but that we were, instead of moving off of Amazon EBS uh, solid state to Amazon uh, solid state with the kind of cold storage backing it, we were going to instead just use I Amazon i3 instances, right? Like that was a design decision that we documented. And now, interestingly enough, we're revisiting this uh, today and having those notes from a year ago of what didn't work, right? Like was really, really helpful. But, you know, if I hadn't been here, right? Like, you, you know, now today, right? The engineers would still be able to read the design docs to understand why. Right. So I, that's so that sounds really good. Documenting not only what was tried uh, and, and worked, but also what was tried and failed. Super, yeah. super critical. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and also, right, like, of what, trying under things, what criteria oh, we would uh, under what criteria we would revisit the decision, right? Like decisions that are technical are not forever, right? They're, you know, maybe for six months, maybe for a year, but at some point you want to revisit that decision. So knowing what has to change in order for us to revisit this rather than, oh, this is the way you've always done it, right? For sure. I mean, organizational dogma is the root of all evil. Uh, it's good to be able to look critically and uh, and, and especially with, with a bit of a, an eye askance to history. Uh, that, that's super, super important. Uh, so last question before we leave, uh, a hot button topic for people all across the industry deploying on Fridays. Uh, you mentioned in your talk that this is something you do. Uh, yeah. what, what, what is, everyone has an opinion here. Right? Uh, why did why does Honeycomb feel comfortable with the decision to go ahead and deploy on Fridays? Right, like it's a little bit more nuanced than we always deploy on Friday. Right, like the decision is use an appropriate amount of judgment when deciding when to deploy. Right, regardless of whether it's Monday or Friday, you probably don't want to deploy a risky change at five p.m. and then walk out the door ten minutes later. Right, like you kind of have to let it go to production, have the appropriate observability to watch it as it hits production, make sure that it's looking good, and then after that you can sign off, right? So I'll push a risky change, you know, on Friday at 3 p.m. I won't push a risky change on Friday at 5.55 p.m., right? Like, I think that's kind of that judgment call of knowing how risky is something and can I observe it to measure the risk and to mitigate that risk? And if you meet that, those criteria, right, like then, then you should be able to proceed. So it's about not artificially imposing rules like no deploys on Fridays, but instead enabling people to have the tools that they need to make that judgment call. Um, 
you know, and ultimately at the end of the day, if you do that successfully, right, it doesn't matter which day of the week that you push something because, you know, if it could blow up five days later, it could equally blow up on, you know, on Saturday or on Monday. So it doesn't, right, like it, it doesn't really matter, right? Like it's equal risks. You may as well do it because at the end of the day, you need to ship features to your customers, right? Like, and if you are slowing down artificially because your build system or your observability is lacking, right, you need to go back and repair that build system of observability. Charity and I aren't telling you to deploy on Friday when you're not ready. We're saying that if you're not ready to deploy on Friday, examine why rather than just treating it as dogma. Right, fair enough. So, so treating treating this argument of deploy on Friday as an artifact, not as an end goal. That's uh, yeah, exactly. an interesting way to look at it, actually. <laughs> yeah, right right, like, as Thank I you for that. What's the problem we're trying to solve, right? The problem we're trying to solve is we need to ship code at a reasonable speed to delight our users, right? What's standing in our way? How can we how can we avoid that? All the automation in the world doesn't, you know, that's mistargeted is a waste of your time, right? Like you need to solve the actual problem. Fair enough. Excellent. Well, hey, you know what? We are bang on time. So that's it for the Q&A for now. Uh, if you have more questions, and I'm sure you do, and I know you do because they are in Slideo, uh, Liz has made available uh, uh, on honeycomb.io slash Liz, all of the information and things that she's worked on. Uh, she's active on Twitter. I'm sure you'd be uh, happy to engage people there in a responsible way. So a big round of applause. Thank you so much for coming through and sharing your knowledge and experience with us today. Of course. I hope people stay safe. I hope people enjoyed it. And yeah, please look at my slides. And I also dropped a link to my office hours if you'd like to have a one-on-one -on -one chat with me. All right. Well, Equitable Culture and Tech has had a long journey, and uh, the journey is not yet over. This example shows us it's possible to break the wall, even in colossal tech companies. So again, thank you, Liz, for sharing with us today. All right. We have come to the end of today's stream. All good things must eventually come to a close. But remember, we have some good stuff coming for you tomorrow. Uh, the feedback form link for today will be posted in the comment section on YouTube. If you have some feedback, uh, hopefully constructive feedback about how things went today, definitely drop that in onto the YouTube chat. We're going to have a promo code made available for an offline event, just like we had in the before times, hopefully scheduled in September. So you get 30% off today if you buy the ticket ahead of time now. Tomorrow, we are going to be joined by Kelsey Hightower. I am really looking forward to have an opportunity to sit down and just have a nice chat with the man, the myth, and the legend. We will send the link later. Please join on that one. Uh, we have an after party, a virtual after party. It's in the same Zoom hangout rooms that we had in between the talks today. So please join. Please come through, say hello, bring a beverage or not. This is your choice, of course. The DevOps, team, DevOps Days Kiev team hopes you enjoyed this event. I hope you enjoyed this event. And as always, smash that like button, smash that subscribe button. That's what keeps the content flowing. Thank you so much. And as always, stay safe out there.